by the lead live stream. Sounds like that's on. Is that ready? Okay. If any members of cabinet are joining the meeting remotely, I need to remind you that you are not counted as being formally present at the meeting and may not vote on any items under dis discussion. I will, however, welcome um, contributions. I don't know if anyone is actually. Um, decisions made this evening will be published after the meeting. Um, I haven't received any apologies apart from Councillor Moema. I don't know if we have any other apologies from members. No. Um, I want to open uh, the meeting tonight with an acknowledgement of the absolutely tragic and, and devastating loss of uh, or murder of Leanne Gordon. Um, I've come from a community event today and I know the community um, that she was very much a part of will be absolutely devastated by what's taken place and the circumstances in which it has taken place. And if, um, if you are able, I'd, I'd invite you to perhaps just offer a, m a minute silence to Leanne and her, her family members and friends and neighbours who will be uh, thinking of her. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to speak about the importance of uh, sort of local communities, resilience and unity in the face of such challenges, um, both at home and in the world. We know it's a really distressing time for many. Um, we have, however, also had the opportunity to come together um, in so many events recently um, to share our sort of good neighbourly values, uh, whether it's at our winter warmer at Saint, uh, where we were able to offer services to, to, I think, over 600 visitors came along to learn about ways they could get help through both the council services and our civic um, services, so our community groups, as well as our libraries, museums, the Money Hub, all uh, in place to show how we can support one another. Um, we were able, through Hanukkah, to uh, attend the lighting of the menorah, um, enjoyed a candlelit service and turning on the Christmas lights. Um, with the local pantomime involvement as well. So we're, we're in this uh, period of, of great challenge, but also um, to remember the sort of opportunity of light and unity at this time of year as well. I'll move to the meeting. Um, so item two, declarations of interest, please. Any declarations of interest? Under urgent business item three, as of the circulation of this briefing, there were no urgent items of business. Under item four, uh, in terms of notice of intention to conduct business in private, uh, there are exempt dependencies for agenda item nine. That's the capital update and property disposal and acquisitions report. And an exempt appendix for agenda item 10. That's the education sufficiency and estate strategy. I will ask cabinet at the appropriate uh, moment whether they require time to review and discuss these appendices. There is also an urgent and exempt uh, report to be considered at agenda item 17, which I will ask members to um, uh, consider. Uh, item five, questions and deputations. We have two questions submitted by members of the public uh, that have been approved by the monitoring officer for inclusion, and they will be taken at agenda item 11. Um, that's Hack Central and Pembury Circus Green Corridor. In addition, using my discretion as chair, I've also uh, allocated dedicated time for questions from the public at agenda item 10, uh, the education sufficiency in the state strategy, and will accept the, the questions at that agenda item. Finally, I've also received questions from Councillor Garbett with respect to um, agenda items 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And I will take these during those respective agenda items. Moving to item six, can we agree the minutes of the previous meetings of Cabinet, or do you have any comments to make? If not, can you agree? Okay. Moving to item seven, 
Uh, we've got the unrestricted minutes of the previous meeting of Cabinet Procurement and Sourcing Committee. Uh, Councillor Chapman, do you want to speak to the report? Thank you, Chair. It was a very short meeting uh, because of the timing of it. Uh, there was only one agenda item, but we nonetheless managed to uh, let uh, contract for the plan works, which you see the internal improvements of 700 council homes. So uh, I'll ask you to note, note the minutes. Thank you, Councillor Chapman. Can we, um, do we need to agree with the agenda? Oh, if we can note then the minutes from CFIC. Thank you. Members noted? Oh, Councillor Coban? Um, I think it's got me as apologies to see this. I, I did come arrive late to the meeting for the minutes of the CPIC meeting, so I was in attendance. Of the CPIC? Yeah. Thank you. We can amend that. Okay, I'll take those minutes as noted. Moving to item eight, the overall financial position report. Um, I know that, that Cabinet scrutiny uh, and all our members and officers have been working hard to balance the budget and we know that we need to get um, all the value we can out of every pound that we spend through um, Hackney Council. Unfortunately, the central government has absolutely failed to give enough funding to local authorities. It's, we are not alone in Hackney to be uh, challenged by this and we were hopefully looking into the autumn statement for some respite, but there was none um, aside from some relief in local housing allowance, which um, having been out campaigning and, and hearing about the concerns of private renters was um, something we were pleased to see. Um, but really, no recognition of the absolutely severe challenge with them that we're seeing so many local authorities facing. We are particularly concerned that the household support fund, where we had um, in the region, of, well, I think it's 5.6 million um, that we were able to distribute to people most in need through, again, a, a lot of our civic partnerships. And there's been no confirmation that that's going to be repeated and, and I really do think we need to um, press that with, with our with our neighbouring councils. Um, and we have a, a huge challenge in terms of a 57 million budget shortfall that we have to meet by 2627. So we'll have to continue to work with officers to, to navigate that as well as press central government to offer some relief. Um, Councillor Chapman, if I can invite you to introduce the report. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. I, I'll just add uh, add to, to what you've said there, which is uh, you know very important. I think helpful and important summary. Um, just to say that uh, it's regret regrettable that we're reporting an increase in the overspend uh, for the current year in this report. Again, as you'll see from the report, this is due to the, the financial pressures that all um, uh, all of local government is facing in terms of the, the adult and children social care pressures and, and the increasing cost of uh, preventing homelessness, um, uh, all pressures on, on the council uh, in the light of the uh, ever diminishing resources as you know, set out in your introduction elsewhere in the report. Um, which brings us on to the, you know, the, the financial situation in place and, the next financial year and as you'll see from the report and you'll recall from our last year's budget report we faced a 22 million pound gap in our budget for the 24-5 financial year uh, and in this report there's a set of um, uh, the second set uh, of uh, savings proposals set out in paragraph 2-9 I think and in the appendix which we're asking for cabinet agreement to. Are there any questions or comments from members? No, in that case, if we can move to the recommendations as set out, um, I'd um, appreciate a show of hands as well as verbal affirmation to approve the savings as summarised and the acceptance of the grant from the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero's Green Heat Net Network. Can we? Um, thank you very much. Great. Okay, moving to item nine, capital update and property disposals and acquisitions report. Um, in terms of uh, the management of our assets, we are still able to invest and it's very important to us to make community investment where we can to benefit as many people as, as possible. I'm particularly pleased to see that we are investing in our Shoreditch um, Adventure Playground, providing that new play hut, um, that we're looking at the Care Leavers Hub, really important for our young people there, and a cycle scheme on Green Lanes. Um, but I do note that inflation and cost pressures mean that works are, are more expensive. And again, we need to chase that national funding to help us with that. Again, Councillor Chapman, if I can turn to you to introduce the report. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yep, I just introduced this report, which is about, about to ask for approval on a number of the capital issues, uh, as we continue to invest in the borough 
in our capital program. I particularly draw your attention to the uh, investment in the Care Leavers Hub, an investment to fund the CCT installation and repairs work, uh, the Ferncliff Family Contract Centre, and investment in, in the Shoreditch Park New Huts. And I, you know, I'm uh, just it's illustrative of uh, the work that's going on here and the continued, uh, as I said, investment in the borough. We're also asking for some changes into the leasing arrangement at uh, Shoreditch Town Hall, which is as set out in the report, which will um, facilitate the, the further investment in Shoreditch Town Hall. Move the recommendations, Chair. Uh, well, can I see if there are any questions or comments from Cabinet? I can see Councillor Coben. Councillor Coben? Oh, in that case, Councillor Garbett. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, only two short questions for me, just regards to the Shoreditch Town Hall. Um, one was just, does the council know that have an estimate of how much profit the office group will make from leasing the hall for over 150 years to ensure we've got a fair return? And then, are there any conditions attached to the works in terms of retrofit and insulation? Councillor Jackson. Thank you, Councillor Garbutt. Um, as you may be aware, the Council's thoroughly scrutinised the additional value that is created for the, for the office group through this lease repair. This is reflected in the, the premium being paid, which is substantially higher than the, the reduction in the current value to the Council. And um, the Council's consultants have advised that the premium offered is good value and the Council's principal value has corroborated this. So I'm glad to reassure you on that. The works that Shoreditch Town Hall Trust intend to undertake are summarised in their business plan and include structural repair and remedial works to the facade, tower and assembly hall balcony, replacing mechanical plant with more substantial alternatives, improvements to external lighting and insulation of a ramp to improve accessibility, all very important, and some various internal modification. We, the council isn't imposing specific conditions relating to the retrofit installation, but the extent and prioritization of the work will depend on the amount of funding which is available to the trust. And the final scope of all this is something we will discuss with the trust in the new year. Um, but the, the, the priority of the trust will be to address any health and safety and, and statutory compliance work required, but obviously comes top. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Councillor Chapman. Do you, Cabinet need to review or discuss the exempt appendices before we move to the recommendations? No? Okay. Um, in that case, the recommendations are set out to approve the scheme for Children's and Education Directorate, the scheme for finance and corporate resources, the scheme for climate, homes and economy, the Section 106 capital scheme, and all the schemes outlined in Section 12, the surrender of the head lease, and to authorise the acting director of legal democratic electoral services and the director of strategic property service to agree on commercial terms and to delegate authority to the interim group director of finance and the acting director of legal democratic and electoral services. I should have just said I set up. <laughs> <laughs> and you um, uh, agree verbally and also with a show of hands. Agreed. If agreed. agreed. Councillor Pajana Thomas, Councillor Etty. Uh, sorry, Councillor Pajana Thomas. Yeah. Agree. Thank you. Yes, I, I did say yes. Sorry, we just need a show of hands as well. Thank you. Okay, moving to item 10, education sufficiency and estate strategy. Um, I'm In the interest of time, I'm going to move straight over to Deputy Mayor Bramble to introduce the report. Uh, thank you, Mayor Woodley. I would first like to thank everyone for attending uh, today. And it's, it's good to see um, some of the head teachers here from the schools that are within scope and to see parents and carers. I just want to thank all of you for your engagement through this process. As, as leaders of your schools, you have done over and beyond what could ever be asked or called for you to hold your school community together in one of the most challenging times. And I just want to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge the work of the education where officers, and rightly so, have spent hours on end and tirelessly working through this piece of work to pull together evidence and documents for Cabinet to consider. I want to thank uh, Cabinet colleagues for your questions, your probing, your curiosity 
and being integral to ensure that I am doing the best that I can do while working alongside officers and head teachers around this. Your calls, dialogues, meetings has not gone unnoticed and that too should be noted as well. At schools are not just a place where children are educated, they are the hub, the life and heart of our communities and that's why it makes this decision that is faced before us so difficult. No one comes into elected office to be uh, considering amalgamating or closing schools. No officer joins a council wanting to make a difference. But however, we are in this situation out of our hands and sometimes as elected members, well, certainly as elected members and sometimes as officers, we are presented in difficult situations and those difficult situations sometimes mean we have to take difficult decisions. We are not here by the fault of any individual school nor any individual school leader. And I must continue to reiterate that. It isn't anyone's fault. 97 or 98% of our schools are good or outstanding. Neither Paul or Jason are shaking their head at me. So that, that figure is right. They are fantastic schools doing good work. Um, and while there's always things that we want to improve because we have high aspirations, they are good schools. People want to come to our schools. People look at Hackney education schools and what to are curious about what we've done we've gone from being some of the work well the worst performing borough we didn't get to say we're worse than that was us we were at the bottom of the heap and we failed a generation of children and those that have done well have done well despite us not because of us and that's something that we all carry even though many of us weren't even in these chambers at that time we are um, now um, at a place where we have the, some of the best Schools. Now we have some of the best schools.
Um, I think we're safe to resume. Um, Deputy Mayor Bramble. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think I was talking about how we had failed a generation and they had done well despite us and not because of us. Whereas we're in a different place now, we've got some fantastic schools within our families of schools. Uh, why we're in this situation, as I said, it's no fault of any individual school, and many of the factors will sit out the council's control, but what's happened is that there has been a drop in the birth rate, and we get the information from the Greater London uh, Assembly, and because of the drop in birth rate, there are less children taking up school places. That's been impacted by Brexit, where you've had families moving back uh, to Europe. You've also had the cost of living, where families move out of uh, the, the borough. Um, that's impounded as well if you've got temporary uh, housing as well, meaning children flux in and out of the borough. Also, the benefit cap had an impact as well, where the government uh, made a decision they were only going to uh, spend a certain amount on how much they were paid towards somebody's rent. Many of the ha Hackney uh, accommodation, the properties are quite high, so a lot of the rent could not no longer be paid or people could be housed in Hackney anymore and meant they were moving out. Also, for some calls, uh, schools, the competition of free schools, where schools can set up in any local authority at any time without any negotiation or consideration or dialogue with the local authority and choose to set up a school. And then, you know, parents, carers will choose a local school. They're not thinking it's a free school or not a free school. And that's uh, obviously that's uh, that's fine. But that has had an impact um, as well. And then so when we are faced in this uh, scenario where it's becoming increasingly difficult to ensure that schools stay sustainable, because ultimately you are paid, every school is paid per child that attends that school. And Hackney now is millions of pounds, has millions of pounds less to spend on education because of those vacancies. So on average, you're meant to have a 5% surplus. Hackney has a 21% surplus of school places across the, across all schools. I think we've got about 600 unfilled uh, vacancies. So you're talking over 30 million pounds that is missing from money that would else be in schools. And it's things like paying the bills, the upkeep of the schools, paying for interventions, extra staff, extracurricular activities, all of the things that schools offer that we love and really want to hold on to, all of those things begin to dissipate and be at risk when there isn't enough money in the school to sustain those things. I'll pause the chair and I know there's some questions. Um, before I welcome members of the public, are there any questions or comments from Cabinet? The Council's constitution allows for um, 15 minutes at Cabinet for all questions from the public, but given the number of um, uh, members of the public who have come forward, I'm using my discretion to allow up to 30 minutes. Um, I suspect that will all still fly by. Um, I'd like to welcome Hazel Cooper, Mike Cooter, Hannah Boyd, Christopher Davis, Hendrik Elstein, Karine Lucas, Dorothea Panella Pulu, Tina Hooterman, and Tara Mack. I apologise if I've missed anyone. Do make yourself known. Um, if so, um, do you want to call you in order, um, Hazel, first? Thank you. Um, I want to say that the report we found disingenuous. You acknowledge at the beginning that the voluntary cap by schools is one mechanism to manage falling roles. But your analysis of the vacancies at the, in the appendices is based on the higher official PAN numbers. But this doesn't reflect the reality of parents who are actually trying to look for alternative places for their children now. Um, and this is reflected in the recent consultation. Parents said, we can't find places. And that particularly in the southwest, where a number of the, the sort of central southwest area, which is where for the, all four of the proposed schools are. So can you accept that the closure of the four schools concentrated in kind of one, not neighbourhood, but certainly certainly one part of Hackney, means that the, your cuts in the provision are too deep for this part of the borough? Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. So the cap-ins are an unofficial uh, reduction to school intakes and they do not form the basis of school place planning so that um, they are not included in the future projections or the demands of local authorities. So where we've where we've had cappings, that's where Hackney Education have worked with school leaders to think about reducing the amount of children that can come into any given year groups, it will be reception, to try and help that individual school remain sustainable. But when you're talking about how you make that school sustainable, you have to include all of the, the numbers. So for example, to, make, to hopefully make this clearer, if you have a two form entry school and you go down to one form of entry, if you're thinking about numbers, if you're thinking about what needs to happen for that school to remain financially stable and viable to be able to do the best for all of those children in that school, even if you have reduced that school to one form of entry, you still have to consider the two forms of entry across the whole school. So that's why the numbers may look different as they are. So if the cabinet decides to, to progress the proposal of 105 reception class places, they will remove from the borough's um, plan, which is the published administration number. So I hope that's clearer. However, in isolation, it does not address any issue for any individual school around the vacancies of places. And the council will continue to work, uh, sorry, Chair, with in collaboration to make sure we've got a graduated approach to reduce places and working in partnerships actually with other schools, which are faith schools and maintain schools and academy as and where we can. But obviously with the council, we only have the authority to have mainstream schools in scope. But because we want to work collaboratively, where schools are willing to, officers are speaking to all schools um, in Hackney. Thank you, Chair. Do you have a supplementary or shall I move to Mike Cooter? I just don't think that answers the question about the parents' perspective. So parents are getting figures from your own in-year admissions team based on the capped figures. That's what they, if they go and say, I want to move now, they get the capped figures. So that's what I'm trying to say is that the reality, what parents actually get told is available to them right now is not based on the official plan. I get that that's your analysis, but that's not what parents are facing. That's not what they're told, where the vacancies are, how many there are. You know, so you're analysing it saying that Holy Trinity, for instance, and Princess May have a 60 form, sorry, two form 60 place schools. There's only a few vacancies in any year group because they've already reduced it down to a single form in the unofficial capping. And that makes a huge difference if you're looking for a space for your child at this moment in time. Can, can you direct that as a question or is that a um, comment? Well, I mean, my question was, you didn't answer the question that I said in the in my first point, which is that these cuts are concentrated in four schools in roughly a quarter of the borough. If you're looking for a place right now, there aren't any places available. And the consultation in the last, you know, in the statutory process, people told you that during the, that process. And your analysis continues to only look at the published figures, not the reality. And you're making decisions based on the published figures. And I, I do understand that, but you're not acknowledging the reality that parents are facing. So why do you continue to only present it in that way and not think about the impact that it's having and the choices that families are having to make right now? So there are, there is availability in other schools um, in in that location where you're talking about. It, there are vacancies um, in Princess May. The figures have been done around the numbers in those four schools and thinking about how the numbers in those four schools will impact being able to support the whole of those schools going forward. So I understand and acknowledge your point but it doesn't change the the viability and how those schools will be able to be sustainable going forward because the numbers 
um, of children taking up places are not there to take up those school places. Can I move to Mike Cooter? Thank you, Chair. My question is this. Hackney Education, we're not prepared for this process. The wording of the proposals around merger or closure has changed significantly throughout the engagement and consultation process and has been misleading for pupils and their families and especially for staff. The guidance clearly states that the creation of a new school via amalgamation means it has to be a free school. Why was this error central to the proposals for so long? So thank you, and apologies, but I didn't thank you for your uh, question as well. Uh, so the council does acknowledge the potential of the terminology associated uh, with the organisation changes, and we absolutely apologise for any uh, confusion that has cost, uh, caused parents or, or carers. You know, that is unhelpful. And equally, if any staff um, were impacted by that as well, uh, and we should have made that, made that clearer in the September report. Um, adopting plans and language are like I close Baden Powell Primary School from September, guarantee that all children, for example, will guarantee a place in Nightingale School if they wanted to. And I think it's just been clearer on that. And hopefully we've done some of that uh, now because it ultimately we can say there are places available um, where we thought about uh, where schools should be amalgamated and we've talked about the reasons uh, for that. So we look at how close those schools are, where children are traveling from, is it in a, a pro is it appropriate walking distance for that child to get to school with, with their parents and carers, um, of course, that those that still need support in doing so. And hopefully the change of language around that is a bit more, a bit more helpful. But we have to say if parents want to, because ultimately parents obviously do have uh, the, the choice of that. And in addition, in September report, I think in Appendix F, the report shows that the meaning of the impact or merger and amalgamation uh, specifically for staff. And they're thinking about the process of what happens uh, with staff and ultimately uh, Hackney Education, if a decision is made, would obviously be working closely with every school and the school staff. So we acknowledge that the confusion of the, the language and hopefully that's now made clearer. Um, I have a follow-up question on that. I'm afraid, uh, as you would have seen from the pre-read uh, material that we sent to you, the question is not a problem with uh, nomenclature or the terms used. Um, parents and staff were officially ad advised by yourself and by representatives from Hackney Education that mergers would include and constitute a merger of both staff and pupils. When the plans were introduced to staff uh, in March, the discussions were based upon staff reapplying for jobs in a newly established school. Newly established school being the terminology which is used in the informal consultation. When parents uh, in the briefings which you held in public asked about this, they were told that no one school would have all of the staff, that staff would be merged from two schools into one, and there would be continuity of teaching staff and ethos in a new merged school. This is not a confusion about whether the term merger is used or amalgamation. It's a fundamental failure to acknowledge to people who are asking direct questions about it that a new school is not possible under free school presumption. You can't make a new school, you can't close two schools and rehire staff because if you close a school and open a new one, you'll have a free school, right? This is very clear in your state strategy, which is copied across from the statutory guidance. So my question is, why was this confusion either willfully or through negligence continued right up until September when, in fairness, you corrected the language, but this is after the major public consultation and then when you send letters out to parents, the cover letter of that is talking about mergers. My understanding is that everything you've addressed has been clarified in the report. I don't remember it of the meetings, people promising that. All it's, uh, of the it's reported in the minutes uh, so by the council in your briefing paper, and we give you the page numbers. Sorry, if you can go through the chair. So you're, you're talking about that when we had the drop-ins where myself, well, 
then Councillor Woodley, Mayor Woodley and officers were there. I don't remember conversations where we said to everybody that everybody would be able to join the school and everybody would uh, be able to go and all staff would go all together. I don't, I don't remember anyone giving that, saying that, because I'm not sure legally we could make those promises to anyone. What we, what I, I, what I remember us saying is that obviously we would want all staff to be able to be considered in this. We want to, we would hope that any two schools that came together, you would want and hope that some staff from that school would go with those children. Equally, if you're going from one form of entry to two form of entry, inevitably there would that that school that the children are going to would need more staff so you would you would expect you would hope that those staff would come from those existing schools but could i physically promise that or officers i don't i don't remember anyone doing that because i don't think legally we could do that and i suppose why i'm saying that is that because i know the amount of times I've asked officers, could we do that? And I was told, well, no, you no, you can't. And you're right. We did follow the DFE guidelines. And because of that, there are certain uh, ways we have to use and certain terminology. But I, I don't recall anyone at any of those meetings uh, saying saying that and making promises. Because, no, that that because I think that would be unfair to, to make promises like that that we know we couldn't keep. Can I move to Hannah Boyd? Good evening, Antoinette. Um, it's been claimed repeatedly throughout this process that the proposal to close a school is a last resort. And you've told us again tonight that no one goes into this wanting to close any schools and we've been told that if creative solutions are presented that they will be considered um, and obviously we're aware that uh, a creative solution has been presented and that back in July a specialist French school contacted the council with the proposal of a co-location specifically saying this could really help one of the schools under threat um, and this hasn't been brought up until I our conversations, right? Um, it would have an obvious financial benefit to the school. I've seen some of the figures and it could really, really help, help with the surplus space. So my question is, what is happening with that? And why are we here at Cabinet and it hasn't yet been properly considered? So Hannah, uh, you have written to me about this recently and apologies that I hadn't got back uh, to you before this evening. I think I uh, a, a approved uh, a response back to you. You wouldn't have seen it this evening. Uh, it was taking long, not because it wasn't important or uh, it wasn't a priority. It was taking officers just some time to look into it and look at the feasibilities and understand what could and couldn't be done. I want to thank you first for even coming forward with a suggestion and proposal. Uh, so my understanding is that uh, the school, the independent school did um, a, approach uh, the, the council. So it's, uh, for want of a better word, the independent school organisation. So I'm going to refer to it from now on as the ISO regarding this process. I think the issue was what the understanding is that their criteria is that they want a site that could accommodate at least one form entry school and or be co-located alongside an existing school as a separate one form entry school. Uh, that was my, that's what my understanding, and Colson remains open with their one form entry cohort, would not be in the position to accommodate that on either basis of the site, and only, um, my understanding is the information that I was given that they would only be interested if the school, Colverston was closed. So I don't know if that sounds different to the conversation that you've had. So we obviously need to have a further dialogue and I'm happy to meet um, with officers outside of the meeting once a decision is made um, either way. Um, the suggested option is to allow the independent organisation to deploy part of the school for a few months while they hope to grow their cohort. But I think what, it, what that does, it fails to bring about the the sustainability that Culverson need eventually. So it's 
if they are waiting over a period of time to build up their number base, that doesn't help Halverson's immediate pressure and challenge of needing the vacancy in the finance or the raising of revenue immediately now. But as I said, I'm happy after decisions made tonight to have a further uh, dialogue uh, around that. Um, uh, maintained schools are able to, of course, go into an agreement with any organisation for non-exclusive use of the school premises outside of letting uh, times, and that can be negotiated. But if you enter into an informal agreement, um, that needs to be done through the governing body. And also, if you go anything longer than six months, you then have to go to the Secretary of State to ask permission. So there's quite a few steps. If this uh, scenario is going to be looked at, there are quite a few steps that have to go through a process. And I'm not saying don't go through those steps or explore those options. I suppose my concern is um, that because of what they are saying they need uh, from the school, it means that at the moment the numbers won't be there to help save the school in the immediate uh, time, which is, which is, which is now. Yes, apologies, Chair. I'll try to be briefer in my response, Chair. So I definitely have a follow-up because that information that you're repeating back to me is very different to what I heard that they were looking for. I also think this was a solution that should have been considered for all of the schools in scope. I wasn't just bringing it up. You know, I feel lucky that I knew about it and wanted to present it as an option for Colverston, but it could have massively saved one of the other schools in scope as well. And I don't understand why if you first found about, out about it in July, which is six months ago, we've had, we are now at this point where a decision is going to be voted on and it will be too late. So I know, I'm sorry, that my heart is beating like mad because I'm so upset about this, that this feels like negligence, that this hasn't properly been considered. And I would like to know, not just you, because I don't want to put you in this position, but I would like to know what the officer's response is to that. So I think I, officers won't respond directly in this, in this meeting, and I'm sure I'm happy to liaise with them and come back to you. I can only apologise if uh, you're saying you raised this in July and we're only getting back to you now. That isn't... Not me, it's when it was brought up. When it was brought up and, you know, uh, yeah. I think I think it depends on... I would imagine it would depend on when it was raised, how it was raised, if it was part of the consultation, all of the things that would need to go through due process. It's all, it's all part of the process of the consultation. So some things that are raised you get an immediate response. Some things are part of the um, consultation process. You mentioned other schools, the same, um, re the same reasoning that I gave why this may or may not work for Colverson would be the same for all of those other schools as well. You still have to go through due process. Ultimately, any arrangement of a longer than six months, you'd have to go to the Secretary of State. Uh, for example, organizations, uh, may offer one thing but you know if they want the building for themselves or the you they want the school to close for a period of time or you know if you don't have separate entrances for your school there are lots of things to um consider as part of the, the process um hannah I, I i know i see you shaking your head hannah if you honestly believe you me i don't think any officer or member is deliberately sitting and withholding information or things that could work uh, you know, I hope you take our word for it. It's a choice that you have to make, but there's no one in this chamber that would willfully sit back on any decision that would help change where we are if it was possible. So yes, I absolutely put my hands up. I'm not going to blame or put it over to officers. I'm sitting here, I'm answering the question. I absolutely take full responsibility and I apologise. But believe you me, if this scenario that was suggested in, even in the last couple of days when I've been meeting with officers, I don't believe that any officer, if that could change the immediate context of what we're doing tonight, I, we would have taken that step and thought about how we get those arrangements for all of the schools if that process was as straightforward 
as it could be. But as I said, outside of this meeting, depending on what is dis uh, discussed, I'm happy to have that dialogue and invite officers uh, to that meeting. Thank you, Chair. Can I move to Christopher Davis, if that's who you'd like to speak next? I'm going by the list as given, so you can uh, change around if you prefer. Hi there. Um, in its equality impact assessment, the council fails to provide a single example of how the consultation has informed its decision making. The consultation responses um, have been overwhelmingly against the proposals uh, for the informal rising 90% uh, against, rising to 97% in the formal consultation for the Culverston proposals. Um, how has the consultation had any effect or any adjustment to uh, to the proposal and what mechanism was there that could have altered the plan? So the council considers it has consulted um, lawfully. So there is a team of uh, legal and governance officers that uh, give advice to officers. We have a, a communication team that goes through the consultations and they look at the, the process, they review the process and make sure that we're, what we're doing is the right thing to do, whether it's where we started before at the informal part of the consultation process, which is something that we didn't have to do as a local authority, but we felt it was the right thing to do because we felt it was uh, better for us um, as lead uh, politicians and as officers to go into the school. So staff, school leaders, parents, carers can hear that message first from us. So it did prolong the process. And then with the formal consultation, making sure that we take all the legal government, governments, sorry, governance around the process, uh, you know, Obviously, all assessments and thinking about equality impacts assessments is all important and it's something that officers do and they follow the guidance uh, that is set out within the legal framework to do that. And the process is detailed in the report um, under the statutory notice summary and that's covered in points 420 to 423 in terms of the process that they took. I don't know if you want to supplement your unconscious. We're on 23 minutes. So if we want to hear from the other um, questioners, it's up to you. Hendrik Elsting. Hello. The proposal and consultation process itself has been damaging to the school, uh, to all of the schools, um, as parents uh, leave and, and other families do not want to join these schools under threats of closure. Hackney Education appears to have actively worked against Holverston with admissions staff advising families during the informal consultation not to go there as the school is to close and reception numbers further suppressed by the misallocation of non-preference places. Under these circumstances, under these conditions, how do you expect the school could have possibly survived this, uh, so to speak, consultation? I think we've had this conversation many times and I'm sure we'll continue to deliberate over it. It's, you know, how much does the consultation damage the schools? And once you say there, there's an issue in the school around uh, filling places, how much then does that have an impact? And I don't think you could get away from that because once parents, communities be, and carers become more aware, you know, you're right, parents might begin to make different decisions. I would always reflect on the point, though, that even before the consultation, the numbers were low. Even before the consultation, and we were talking about this publicly, those schools were still at risk and they wasn't enough numbers to make those schools sustainable. So while you can say, has the consultation maybe escalated or expedited or even indeed speed up the potential process? I mean, we can all reflect on that. Um, obviously, once it becomes more live, parents, as I say, will make decisions maybe differently or earlier than maybe they would have if we hadn't spoken about it. 
but us talking about the vacancies didn't create those vacancies. We only started talking about this because those vacancies uh, were there. You know, the council does acknowledge that these proposals, having an utility, as I said, had um, a, 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 an impact on that. We are monitoring movement of, of pupils closely across Hackney, Hackney schools and looking at that, the impact of what that means. Uh, the council has not actively discouraged or encouraged applicants to any other schools um, in the scope. You know, those schools are available and if parents do want to come to those schools um, in, in mid-year admissions, that, that is still um, applicable. But we have to look at those schools because of the vacancy rate within those schools. Um, as I keep saying, all of our schools, 98% are good or outstanding. We can discuss offset at another time. You know, people have a strong view about offset or some people may not have a view about offset. But that's the, that, that is the framework that we're measured against. And against those measures, Hackney schools are doing very, are, are doing very well. Um, but as I said, despite how good our schools are doing, because of the factors outside of schools remit, we're in this, this position. Uh, for 2023 admissions only, the council actively decided to exclude the four schools under proposals to can close them from the allocated process. This was not considered appropriate to allocate places for 2023 admission to these schools. Again, it was really thoughtful thought-provoking process going backwards and forward with officers thinking about what was the best thing to do but given the questions even that you have raised tonight about okay why are they in scope if this is in uh, taking things into consideration they weren't included in that um there were um two uh cases where application was not successful for any of their preferred schools and culverson was the nearest school and had non-preference allocations being made at culverson that would have resulted in two additional offers offers in april 16 uh, 2023 uh, on non so on the national offer day but whether these children would have taken up their places in september uh, 2000, uh, you know, 20, uh, we don't know. That's the thing. You never, you can never confirm places, as you know. Any of anyone that's worked in a school will know that you, you, you never know until you start that official school day uh, who's confirmed in attending. Again, we're almost at time. Is it okay to move to Kareen? Sorry. Good evening. Acne planning official referred to Coverston School as key infrastructure for the Dawson plan. Calculation made using council and GLA data sets show the Dawson plan would deliver close to 100 primary school children to the doorstep of Culverston, with 150 more age four and under in the short to midterm. Why does the council ignore this huge number of children for whom Culverston will be their closest primary school provision? So just to reassure you, we're not ignoring anything. I'm looking at my colleague, Deputy Mayor Nicholson, and um, who constantly uh, speaks of the Dalston plan and the importance of the Dalston plan. And we are, you know, we are proud of any new regeneration that brings homes into Hackney and the much needed homes that our families and single people need. However, despite that, even in the Dawson plan, again, it doesn't bring enough children into the area to take up and fill all of those vacancies immediately to be able to keep all of those school places open. So the council has and will remain um, to consider efficiency places in the planning area. And within the statutory walking distance, uh, officers have looked at the calculations, looked at the numbers, and they still feel that even um, there are a sufficient school places, if a decision is made for those schools to amalgamate or close, there's still enough uh, existing school places for all of those children. So even if all of, okay, even if, even if the Dawson plan was finished tomorrow for argument's sake, and all of those 
homes were com family homes were complete there's still not enough children to come even if they all went to just for argument's sake Colverston or for argument's sake at uh, De Beauvoir or for argument's sake a little bit further going over to Joe it, it would still not be enough even if we focus on one individual school unfortunately the planning doesn't uh, uh, doesn't yield enough family places to do that and officers have worked over this in great detail so i'm thinking tina and tara maybe not are not here dorothy are the only person who hasn't had the chance to yeah go on then hello good evening um so i'm gonna go back to the pan <laughs> And I'm going to ask you, um, Princess May Prim Primary has voluntarily capped places at 30 pupils per year, and it's running close to capacity, limiting staff expenditure and ensuring financial stability. This proposal will force them to accept an unknown number of pupils from Colverstone. It will not fill the official 60 pan, so they will be forced to introduce vertical class groups and will destabilize the school financially. Why will the council not consider an alternative combination of the Beauvoir and Colveston as the numbers now make more sense? Okay, so alternative options have been considered and outlined in the report under section seven. Merging De Beauvoir and Colveston on the Colveston site was suggested, and I think I've said this to you before, However, based on the pupil numbers, Culverson uh, was unable to be able to accommodate all of those pupils on that on that site. Because um, you are a one form entry and for you to be able to accommodate other children, there wasn't capacity on that site. And I, I you know, I've, I have mentioned that before, but happy to mention that again. Um, the sub, the um, the large drop in the pupil numbers on both schools makes this option feasible in terms of pupil numbers. However, um, it's I know that Colverston um, is working again. You know that your school is working on your your deficit and is working really hard and uh, acknowledge again the work of Blossom Federation. But there's still that financial impact that they're still trying to to work towards. So amalgamating into a one form entry school is not financially uh, viable at the moment for that school for it to be sustainable in the in the way that it is with the numbers that it has. So if you look, as I said, it's outlined in. Uh, section seven, those options, why uh, de Beauvoir was not suggested to come onto the Culverson site. I, I do have a quick follow-up. Sorry. Uh, sorry. We, we, uh, are, we are over time. Sorry, I extended okay, to It's to the last one. I it's the last one. Okay. I, I, just, I just want to understand this. Princess May is now at full capacity as a one form. If the Culverson students go to Princess May, it, it will not be a, a, a two form because it will not have enough students so will you have will you hire a student would you hire teachers to run a two form that's then undersubscribed and what happens if it's undersubscribed over 25 percent will then princess may be in for the chop will you will you close that school because it's a two form that doesn't fill two classes and only has 40 students per year instead of 60 because that was my that was that is my question because you would never fail princess may to the 60 per year but also princess may as it is now it cannot take the colorston students it has to go into a two form that is going to be undersubscribed so how how is Can that you... going to work that's my question sorry yeah switch my card thank you I think I got the gist of that, Chair. So any any potential amalgamation will obviously be monitored by officers really carefully working with those school leaders because we want to ensure if a decision is made that that transition goes as, as best as possible. This isn't about, um, you can ask questions about Princess May and you can rightly answer them, but this is about where schools cannot survive on their own if they can't survive on their own, 
is it feasible for them to be closed and those school those children potentially go to all different schools or is it possible for those schools that are in scope that are in risk that are um, not fun not sustainable anymore the way that they are and ultimately the education everything that you love is at risk is it is it feasible for them to join another school and that's what the decision was made any any issues arising that princess may will have they will work through that with hackney education but there is no issue right now if that amalgamation had this is a, so i i i'm not sure i maybe i just fully don't understand what you're saying because at the moment Princess May is a two-form entry school. They have the ability to have two forms of entry. Um, if they need more staff, I would imagine that school leader would think about the existing staff team and look within that to hopefully negotiate and think about who comes across. I would expect both school leaders to have a discussion. And I know throughout this whole process, school leaders are having that conversation. So the hiring of staff, these are all things that school leaders, if they have to be in that situation, will be thinking ahead and doing those sorts of things. And they would be doing everything they need to do to secure having, addition, having additional children doesn't become an issue in the school, is, is my reflection on it. It doesn't. Uh, what they so, mean is sorry, you will sorry, have a Sorry, I've, 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 I've really okay, have to call it that. Want, but but Councillor Garbis is now in a position to, to pick up questions, and she may pick this one up um, for you. Councillor Garbutt, do you have questions? Thank you. Um, and just firstly, I'd like to add my thanks to officers, school leaders, and everyone who contributed to the consultation. I appreciate this has been really difficult for everybody. Um, as I've said before, I think the approach taken has has made challenge and consultation incredibly difficult. Um, lots of my questions have already been covered by the parents this evening, um, and there's some follow-ups that I'll do, but I'll do those outside. Um, I did want to pick up. Um, I think I think the question that was being asked there was more to do with the protection of the children that go to that school in that not being at risk next time. So if you can respond to that bit. And then there was a question that I asked before, but just want to seek assurance here that the deeds have been fully considered on all the sites. So we know that, that that's been fully considered and we can have reassurance around them being considered because I know that they haven't been shared or been able to be located. So just if we can have that reassurance. Thanks. So you want me to say what predict what will happen in the future? I, you know, what I can reassure you is that school leaders will do everything they can work with Hackney Education to make sure those schools are as viable and sustainable as best as possible. But I cannot predict what every individual school will have. This isn't something that's a Hackney issue. This is London wide. The whole of London has been impacted by this. The whole of London has been turned up by, uh, on its head. We can only do our best by what uh, the GLA, so the Greater London Assembly, uh, figures tell us. And the figures are telling us at the moment there won't be any increase in the birth rate till about 2026. So we're working on that. Um, so the reassurance I can give you is that school leaders, because <laughs> I'm talking to them, will work as hard as they can and be as diligent as they can, working with Hackney Education to do the best for those schools, to make sure they are as strong as they can be. But I'm not sure what other reassurance I can offer because of that, because I cannot uh, see into the future, you know. And Hackney is not unique to this. It's a London issue. So it's greater than anything that we're talking about that sits within uh, these chambers, Councillor Garbutt. Hope that I hope that answers your question and gives you some reassurance that we'll do all that we can. Oh, so the the deeds. I think there was a. I think there was a search. They went back to 1905, and uh, nothing was found on those those deeds. So if and when more information comes forward, I can supply, get back to you in in writing. But I don't have. Um, more information on the deeds at, at this point. I'm concluded. That's good.
Okay, I just need to check with Cabinet whether you want to review the exempt appendices before moving to a decision on the recommendations. No. Okay, if I can ask you again to agree verbally and also by raise of uh, by raising your hand uh, on the recommendations to close or discontinue De Beauvoir Primary School from September 2024. To close, discontinue Randall Kramer Primary School from September 2024. To close, discontinue Colverston Primary School from September 2024, guaranteeing all children a place at Princess May Primary School if they want it. To close, discontinue Baden Powell Primary School from September 2024, guaranteeing all children a place at Nightingale Primary School if they want it. To increase the published admission number of Nightingale Primary School by adding an additional form of entry to all, year, uh, to all five year groups. Okay, thank you, members. Thank you, members of the public, for coming in. I'm sorry this has been a, a difficult evening for us all. Uh, you may leave if you if you'd like to. We'll move to item eleven. That's the Hackney Central and Pembury Circus Green Corridor. I'll just give, give uh, members of the public a moment to leave. Thank you, members. Um, moving to item 11, uh, obviously improving Hackney Central is a, a core manifesto commitment. We really recognise the great work of officers um, in securing funding from a levelling up fund bid to um, progress this work. And we know the report is now moving to the next stage of designing transformation of streets to be safe for greener and better for businesses, and that changes will be done in consultation with local people. Councillor Coburn, would you like to introduce the report? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair, and I'm um, very proud to be bringing this report forward to, to to Cabinet today. We know that for for a long time, Amos Road has been one of the most polluted roads uh, in London, and we know through the Hackney Central Conversations, uh, which had over 3,000 participants uh, in 2019, the ma majority of residents uh, told us about the issues around traffic and road safety, particularly around pollution on Amos Road, particularly on Pembury Junction as well. Um, so what we're doing today is we are not kicking the can down the road anymore. We are bringing forward an ambitious plan, uh, one that meets the priorities of the residents who we spoke to, part of the Hackney Central uh, conversation. And it sits as part of a wider package of intervention that the council very successfully bidded in as part of the Level Up Fund, £19 million investment. I'm going to be talking a bit specifically around sort of the, the, the changes we're going to be seeing in the Amos Road, but uh, it sits alongside, you know, delivering new workspace, enhanced digital access and investment into our cultural ecosystem uh, in the town centre led by the Hackney Central Museum and Library, uh, working with partners to improve public transport accessibility in the town centre too. Um, what we are going to be doing is, is we're going to be taking the equivalent of 10 tennis courts worth of road space uh, into a much more uh, greener space, which is going to be looking at pocket parks, uh, how we really significantly improve uh, the public realm so that this is sets the benchmark for what the streets of Hackney can look like. Uh, and it's something that the rest of London uh, can aspire to as well. Uh, it, it's a significant piece of investment, but it also deals with the issues around the Pembury Junction. And we know that there's been 229 traffic collisions between Pembury Circus and the bottom end of Mare Street, which is obviously quite a huge issue. And we know for any cyclists or pedestrians in that area, it can be quite dangerous. So this set of proposals seeks to sort of help achieve uh, that. The, the, the whole investment that we are putting into 
Amos Road and to sort of Primary Junction will also improve significantly uh, the journey experience for our bus users. Uh, we know that for far too often uh, buses get clogged up in congestion alongside along uh, Amos Road and this hopeful proposal that we'll be bringing forward uh, will be hoping to sort of to look at to dealing with that and improving that experience for our bus users because we know a lot of our uh, workers in Hackney depend on the bus as well. Um, so the paper, what it sets out today is really a plan to go out and work with residents uh, over next year uh, to really complete the works by 2026. So it's, it's quite a significant piece of construction that needs to happen. So it's looking at the green corridor alongside uh, along Amos Road, but also looking at completely changing uh, the design of Pembury Junction. What we do know is, is that you have to significantly reduce the number of traffic to be able to create a safe uh to create a safe sort of passage and the create sort of scheme for for primary junction two um so what we'll be looking to do is is to go out next year very early next year we'll be going out to public after cabinet today if it's passed through cabinet uh to go out and further consult with residents around what the design and the implementation will look like of the project but what we do know is is that this is a commitment from hackney uh to deliver as part of the wider level up fund and hopefully we'll deliver for the priorities of the people of Hackney Central, but more importantly, as I said, really setting the benchmark for what the rest of Hackney can look like, um, and really setting that benchmark and delivering a greener, healthier borough uh, for our people. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from Cabinet? No? Uh, we've received two questions from members of the public, so I'd like to invite uh, Georgia Carey, who's here in person, to ask the first question. Um, excuse me. Uh, just to thank you for um, the attention, uh, sort of much needed attention, um, and the ambition of these plans. Um, speaking on behalf of the Community Action for Pembury Circus, um, to mitigate the funding risks, the poor economic forecast, and the likely change of government during this project schedule. Will the council please commit to prioritizing the delivery of fundamental improvements to the safety of Pembury Circus Junction and pedestrian crossings before the end of March 2025, ahead of any planting on Amherst Road? Thanks. Okay. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Georgia. Um, and it's great to see you again uh, at Cabinet uh, this time around as well. I think just to be very clear, the, the funding that we have secured for this in comparison to sort of the 2019 conversation, which I know that you previously brought forward to, to the previous Cabinet, is, is that, you know, this is £19 million, which is obviously secured for the whole of the Hackney Central 11 month project. Uh, this money has been secured and the plan is, is to is to go out and start to spend it uh, starting from next year, subject to this paper going through cabinet today. It will set up, start with the consultation and going out and speaking with residents, uh, but we very much see the construction of this project going out and we're very committed to that happening. Um, unless there's any circumstance that we cannot sort of foresee at the moment, um, we intend to fully to sort of utilize the funding that's been invested in the council to be able to go out and do the project. Um, as I said, We'll be beginning the sort of the project next year, subject to going through cabinet today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a supplementary. Thank you. Um, so, are you are you confirming there that if in March, the end of March, twenty twenty five, the funding is revoked and it hasn't been spent in a similar situation to what you had with TfL in twenty seventeen? Um, the council will pay for the remainder of the works to ensure the Pembury Junction is completed because the key concern of residents, and it's great that you're talking about residents of Hackney Central, but the key concern of the residents of Pembury Circus who are most affected by, who, who are living on that junction and their businesses are there, is that this is going to be, you know, focusing on greening Amherst Road, which is, which is all, you know, fantastic, but doesn't address the key concerns about the safety and accessibility of, of Pembury Circus. So just to clarify, I think there's a bit of misunderstanding about the way the funding arrangements work. So this funding is obviously, we've secured the funding uh, through the Level Up Fund and will be ring fenced for this project. Um, so the government's committed to funding the council. So what the council will do is, is draw down the money subject to it to going through cabinet to start the works there. So we're not waiting until 2025 to claim the money that's not what the case is the tfl 
funding that you relate to, to you spoke about before is a very different funding model and different funding mechanism where TfL would have sub you know would have prioritized the improvement of Pembury Junction as subject to funding being made available, then we would have claimed it, which it didn't. That's a completely different um, scenario to what we face today. This is funding that has been secured, has been ring, uh, ring fenced for this project, and we're not waiting until 2025 to draw down the money. The money will, subject to it going through cabinet uh, today, the council will start to go out and to utilize the financial resources that have been made available through the Level Up uh, Fund to go out and to, to do that. The other thing just to say is, is we're not, this isn't a case of, oh, we're going to do Amos Road, we might not do Pembury Junction, we'll see what happens in 25, 26. What the paper presents today is the whole package and it's committing that the whole uh, the whole project, which includes basically three phases. So it's looking at the Amos Road Green Corridor, uh, it's looking at Pembury Junction and the sort of the improvement and the changes to Pembury Junction, and it's looking at how it sort of release, uh, re relieves traffic alongside Amos Road. Pembury Junction can't work if you don't relieve traffic uh, through Amos Road because the number of cars um, that go through is significantly higher. So it, 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 I understand obviously the, the, the sort of the, 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 you know, like the, I understand where you're coming from in the sense that, you know, residents in that area have been let down before because of the way the funding mechanisms work. But just to sort of reassure you is that this isn't a case of waiting until 2025 or we're waiting to see what's happening in primary junction. This is, you know, committed, subject to going through cabinet today, and residents should see the changes happen in Premier Junction and in Amos Road. Thank you. Um, the second question is from George Townsend, who is unable to join us, so I'll read out his question. The council's plans for Pembury Circus Junction, the Green Corridor, Pembury Road and Hackney Down Station demonstrate consideration of four arms of Pembury Circus, but neglect the west arm of Amherst Road. Can the council commit to including pedestrian safety improvements to the west arm of Amherst Road in the, in the scheme? Thank you, and thank you to the question from uh, George Townsend. I think, firstly, it's important to note that all of these schemes form part of our wider lo lo low traffic plan and lo local implementation plan. And the reason why I say that is because on the other end um, of Amos Road, we are bringing forward plans uh, around the sort of a wider scheme around the Dorston. Uh, low traffic uh, neighborhood as well and we do have other plans around in and around sort of those areas which we see as part of a wider package of interventions that need to happen that all sort of uh, allows traffic to move through flow, flow through and so there, there are other sort of uh, investments that are being brought forward and um, as part of the proposal brought to cabinet tonight the council is also proposing to bring forward the eight hundred seventy two thousand pound of section 106 funding that committed to the primary junction with the 11 million pounds for level up fund um, to introduce that green corridor which hopefully should improve the sort of the, the western arm of Amos Road. Um, this, this scheme will see a significant also improvement uh, to the, the, the sort of the experience for pedestrians uh, on both sides and the report from that is presented to cabinet details shows an indicative layout of the design um, labeled as figure three to the report which shows a significant improvement of the pavement widening as well on, Amos, on the western arm of Amos Road as well. So I just, just to assure, assure George and residents who are living on that side is we're not just sort of looking at this as an isolated scheme. Uh, this is part of a package of interventions um, in and around Amos Road and wider Hackney Central uh, that should hopefully see a reduction of traffic, but also a significant improvement to bus users, uh, pedestrians, cyclists, and obviously those who do need to drive uh, to get around for job. Thank you. I'd now like to ask um, Councillor Garbett to ask her question. Thanks. I only ask a quick one. The yeah, again, just adding my thanks to this. It's absolutely brilliant to see. And I think you mentioned there's going to be an extensive um, suite of resident engagement because obviously I note that Graham Road and Urswick Road have predicted an increase in traffic. So just yeah, stressing the importance of making sure that they get really kind of thorough engagement. And just a quick question on whether there's a plan for the re a reduction in car park spaces as part of the scheme. So thanks, Councillor Garbett. Uh, I think in relation to your first question, I think we we definitely recognise the importance of Graham Road, and we've been in meetings and previous briefings uh, around the Hackney Central project to talk about. It. And I know you've you've obviously raised that too. I think there's two things there. So one is is in the appropriate sort of moment, subject to it going through cabinet today, we will start that engagement with residents on uh, on uh, Graham Road, but also some of the other boundary roads as well to look at how we can mitigate some of the potential increases of 
of traffic should we get there sort of uh, after the 26 um, sort of timeline. Um, we're also separate to that. I think there's a separate conversation around Grain Road and some of our other main archery roads in Hackney, which is bringing forward a main road strategy, which hopefully we should be publishing very soon in the, in the new year, which will look at sort of dealing with what other ways in which we can help support uh, sort of buses and pedestrians get around the borough quicker. And, you know, at the moment on Grain Road, we have a, a consultation that's currently live around sort of extending the operating times for the bus lane on, on Grain Road, which should hopefully significantly improve that experience for uh, residents um, or people getting around. But also it's looking at significant uh, improvement of the greening alongside Brain Road because we want to make sure it's a pleasant place to live uh, and to visit, as well as obviously driving through for, for those that um, who do need to do that. So I think absolutely we're committed to making sure that we are doing that uh, as part of that. In, in relation to your second question about the, the car park um, spaces in, in Hackney Central, I think, as I said, you know, there's a danger with this project that we can look at this as a specific uh, specific look at this paper and look at it as an isolated intervention but actually when you take the wider investment that's happening into to, to sort of Hackney Central um, it's looking at the sort of the holistic picture of all of our spaces uh, across Hackney Central and how we can make sure that it's it delivers best for the people of Hackney Central but also for the people of Hackney obviously who use it as a destination and make it that destination in Hackney where people want to visit. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, can we move to the recommendations as set out in the report? Again, if we can have verbal agreement and a, and a show of hands. Agreed. Thanks, everybody. Um, moving to item 12, confirmation of arrangements for the operations of the public mortuary. Um, I know new investment will ensure legal compliance and capacity, but most importantly, dignity and peace of mind to family and loved ones and that uh, this consultation on public health funerals is an important moment to update our procedures. Um, Councillor Kennedy, do you want to introduce the report? Um, thank you. Yes, uh, members will be aware that we have um, a very beautiful listed Victorian uh, mortuary building on the western side of the churchyard at St John at Hackney. Um, uh, but that needs considerable work um, done to it. Um, previously, Cabinet, thank you, you have agreed um, nearly £2 million worth of capital spend um, in order to carry out the necessary works on that building. Um, I do have to read out, though, just for us to be legally cor uh, correct, a correction to the paper um, because um, events today have overtaken us. So um, the decision you're being asked uh, to take today um, is to agree the proposals for the temporary arrangements while we're doing the work. So that is the temporary operations of the mortuary to be relocated to the mortuary in St Pancras and for the frozen storage requirements um, that we have in Hackney to be relocated to um, Jackson's Hub in Kent. But since this report was published, the report mentions that Logan Construction um, have been awarded the contract. They have today uh, withdrawn as contractors to undertake the work. Um, and uh, we're, we're in discussions with um, alternative contractors. We don't think the date is going to slip, but it does mean that the name in the papers um, is incorrect. But I am still asking you to take the key decision, please, colleagues, uh, for those arrangements while we have the work carried out. Thank you. Um, are members content with that? Are there any questions or comments in regard to that? Yes. Okay, I'd like to ask Councillor Garvis a question. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, another similar question to earlier, just is there an opportunity to decarbonise or access potential for solar panels, insulation, heat pumps, et cetera, and is that being considered in the construction or the retrofits that works? Um, yes. yes, so with the previous constructor, it was being considered. Um, we've looked at um, how we reuse and recycle building materials. Um, we've looked at, obviously, at increasing the energy efficiency of the building as part of the works um, and installing much more energy efficient uh, fridges and freezers. Um, uh, the original um, investigation um, didn't take um, the possibility of um, an air source heat pump pump into account obviously with a new contractor we might have um, opportunities to do that um, but it did specify putting in points for photovoltaics um, and there's a, an officer work stream working on uh, uh, how we could get photovoltaics successfully onto the building um, it's likely that that will require separate planning application because it's a listed building 
Thank you. If we can move then to the recommendations as um, well set out by Councillor Kennedy in his statement. Um, are we happy to agree and please um, verbally in with a show of hands? <coughs> Councillor Janice Thomas. Thank you. <laughs> it was Councillor Janice Thomas, you were <laughs> And we move to item 13, proposed changes to the council tax uh, reduction scheme. So I'm really pleased that we're looking at reducing the minimum contribution, which all working age uh, council, council tax reduction scheme claimants um, have to pay from 15% to 10%. That takes us well on our way to our manifesto commitment to uh, reduce it entirely by 2030. I'd like to invite um, Councillor Chapman to introduce the report. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm delighted to move this report. Uh, as, as you'll be aware, in, in 2022, we, we set out in our manifesto a statement that um, every time we are forced to increase council tax, and we have been continue to continually be forced to uh, increase council tax because of the lack of government funding, that every time we are forced to increase council tax, we will also give low-income households a bigger discount on their council tax bill, despite no support from government for this. We'll provide low-income households with a 90% discount for their council tax liability by 2026, um, and e.g. 2023, I have to point that out, and, and a full 100% discount by 2030. Um, I, I, I can't move this item without uh, mentioning uh, the excellent work done by scrutiny on a quite a long and involved uh, scrutiny process, which uh, was very helpful for us in both formulating the scheme, but particularly in, in the consultation. And we've, under, we've undertaken the, the consultation in accordance with the statute, um, the statute requirements, and that is set out uh, as an attachment to this report. Um, so while I'm disappointed that the government continues as part of its funding regime to force us to put up council tax, so an ever increasing burden of the cost of the council falls on local residents, I am delighted to recommend this, this scheme as increasing the discount or, or a reduction in the contribution, depending on which way you look at it, uh, to both cabinet and to council. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to you for your commitment to this and to officers for supporting us in, in bringing it forward. Any questions or comments from Cabinet? No. Uh, Councillor Garbett. Thank you. Um, it's great to see this coming forward. It's just a note that the paper states that the only other alternative option was to do nothing. And I just wondered if there was any consideration or if you explored trying to achieve the 2030 quicker as part of this piece of work. And my second question is just that I've heard from people impacted by the cyber attack who received their bill late, couldn't now can't apply for the CTRS because the six months or the window that they're able to apply has passed. So I just wondered if what was being done to support support those people. Thank you. Can I thank Councillor Garbot for a question? Um, I think to some extent we we might have been victim here of the report templates because um, although do nothing is there I don't think doing nothing was ever an option for, for this administration um, as you be uh, yeah the, 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 I'm grateful for the question because it does um, enable me to say a little bit more about you know the, the lack of government funding here you'll have heard us talk previously about the fact that um, uh, the cuts in external support since 210 now amounts to 150 million a year um, what we should also say is that uh, we now 40 have a 40% higher in real terms council tax than we did in 2010, because not only is the overall level of funding cut, but also the, the proportion that is paid by our residents has increased. And our council tax commi commitment, if you remember, is, is in part, the council tax reduction scheme commitment is in part in recognition of the fact that we are you know, having been forced to increase council tax year by year. Um, as, and as you'll recognise that the council has uh, continued to deal with the impact of the cost of living crisis and welfare reform um, on some of our poorest communities, we are acutely aware that some of our poorest residents have found it difficult to pay contributions towards our council tax, so we're looking at a number of other ways of, of assisting our poorest residents in this regard. 
Um, as it is set out in the report, while the move to 100% maximum by 2030 is the political aim of, uh, sorry, I'm cutting out here, aren't I? The 2030 is the political aim of uh, the administration and a commitment in our manifesto. Uh, it's part funded by the, the increases in council tax we're forced to make. And um, currently, a full 100% it would be unaffordable, but um, it, otherwise it remains a commitment. We'll continue to keep this under review and we have, of course, a focused additional support for specific groups such as Hackney Care Leavers and Foster Carers. In terms of the issue regarding the impact of the cyber attack on timing of billing and subsequent CTRS claims, this is something we look into. We will always aim to be as sympathetic as the rules allow. Uh, but we'll report back to you with the details of how 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 these are, are dealt with in general terms and with some examples. Thank you. Um, if we can move to the recommendations as set out again, show of hands and verbal confirmation. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, to item fourteen, the Hackney homeless and rough sleeping strategy. Um, I'm very conscious of time, but obviously those of us who um, have been following the news and the, and the threat to homelessness, we are really deeply concerned. Um, uh, those of us who joined the Rough Sleeper Council, the reality of this, and I know if you didn't join the SHE, you might have done it on previous years, the pressure of this, uh, the, the kind of the scheme with hostels, whether it be seven days notice, we're, we're so concerned that we're going to see numbers coming up. Um, but I'm, I'm very pleased to see a strategy come forward in, in mitigation. Um, I think technically I, I refer to Councillor Nicholson to introduce the report. I don't know if you will pass to Councillor Etty. Technically, you are absolutely right, Mayor Woodley. Um, and uh, please, over to Councillor Etty. Thank you, Mayor Woodley. Um, this is the homeless homeless and rough sleeping strategy for 2023 to 2026 and within this strategy in i mean we've had our strategy for from in place since 2002 and it's been regularly reviewed to respond to evolving um, circumstances and i'm sure everyone will agree in terms of the current issues we have in terms of government policy combined with the housing affordability in hackney and affecting our communities this is not only within hackney but it's something that affects um across london and despite the current central government's approach to homelessness rob sleeping and asylum seeker the council is committed to keep the resources in place to assist residents in their time of need and also in addition to our commitment in terms of our manifesto commitment to ensure that homelessness is always at the top of political agenda while supporting existing um, services. The last homelessness strategy had four themes, but this current one, we have seven themes. And with regards to these seven themes, I really have to commend the efforts of um, Benefits and Housing Needs Officer, um, the Homelessness Partnership Board, um, lived experiences where we had our consultation, officers across other services, cabinet members across um, across um, services, which um, are numerous to mention, and we came across seven things, and this, that, that's to maximize access to short and long-term affordable housing, to tackle rough sleeping, to support homeless residents with complex needs, to address homelessness amongst young people in Hackney, inequality and the cost of living crisis and also to advise and assist for those with no recourse to public fund and i must also acknowledge that the strategy has also been to living in hackney scrutiny commission and their comments and um, has been taken on board with regards to this strategy so i i in the meantime despite the challenges um we are committed to deliver a supportive and responsive housing its um, service and I commend the reports to the cabinet. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments from cabinet? No, then we'll move to recommendations. Again, a show of hands and verbal um, agreement, please. Thank you. Um, to, moving to item 15, um, can I ask that the press and public be excluded from proceedings? I think yeah, public can have read out the proposal and ask. Sorry? Yeah, so just read out the resolution and then they can decide if they agree with you. No, oh, okay. Sorry. Apologies. I'll do I'll do what I'm told. Um so 
The resolution is that the press and public be excluded from the proceedings of the Cabinet during consideration of exempt items 16 and 17 on the agenda on the grounds that it is likely in the view of the nature of the business to be transacted that were members of the public to be present there would be disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of Schedule 12A to the Local Government Act 1972 as amended. Can Cabinet confirm they agree that the press and public can be excluded so exempt items can be considered? Show of hands and verbal affirmation please. Thank you. I'd like to ask all members of the public and the press to leave the chamber. Thank you.